So welcome back to the CGU Learning Center. Today we have a special treat for you. Uh, we have an actor friend, Jeffrey Breslauer, who has graciously agreed to uh, do an interview with us. And uh, Jeff is an actor and he's had a whole range of experience and I thought it would just be really fun to, to talk to him. So welcome Jeff, it's good to see you. Thank you, Amanda. It's good to see you again too. So Actually, been... my, my job description, whenever I asked about my job description, I always say that I'm an actor, writer, voice artist, and puppeteer. That's, that's a long, how do you fit that on a business card? A uh, very small type. <laughs> but um, yeah, I had to take out things like lawn boy, um, garbage collector, things like that. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I'm a firm believer that if you're going to be in the entertainment industry, you should really have a hyphenated job description. Because I'm a firm believer if, if you want to succeed at A, concentrate on B. And while things are slow in one area, you might try another. For instance, uh, during this pandemic, I've been in self-isolation. Same here for and, the most part. <laughs> and, and a lot of things, theaters are down, uh, movie theaters are shut, except for maybe drive-in theaters on a, on a limited scale. But uh, because of all of that, the acting work is, is extremely limited. And I've been taking to writing. So that's what I'm spending my time doing now. Nice. So uh, just a little background for folks. Uh, uh, Jeff and I actually met in 2012 at the Superman celebration. Um, and whenever I get a chance to go back, I always see that he's there. And in fact, pull up a little bit of uh, memory lane for you here. This was the last time oh, uh, wow. we actually, I actually saw you in person. It was two years ago and Mike and I were on our honeymoon. That's right. Yep. And between you being literally across the country and uh, COVID and everything, just first time I've actually seen your face aside from Facebook since. <laughs> yeah, you're actually, because of this beard, you're seeing less of my face. <laughs> Could be worse, you know, it's not like you've got a full hockey mask on, you know. No, that's true. And spoiler alert, that was you underneath the pink mask. You sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, why don't we start with... Um, when did you get started in, in acting? Okay. Uh, as far as my interest in acting and interested in the entertainment industry, it was when I was pretty much a, almost a toddler. I was the first person on my block who knew who Jack Klugman was. Oh, wow. And um, that was when my age was in the single digits. <laughs> And uh, I would know the names of all the uh, stars, all of the actors on old TV shows. And uh, it, it's been like that always. And um, when I went to college back in uh, September of 1972, I uh, started out uh, as a liberal arts major and then I declared myself a, a creative writing major, a writing major. Oh, wow. And uh, <clears throat> I was taking some courses in uh, broadcasting. And uh, because of the way the classes ran, I found myself in front of the camera more often than behind the camera, where I was supposed to be. <laughs> so I guess the bug hit me then. And I wound up uh, doing uh, shows and I did a blackout sketches in a um, show written by two future uh, senior editors for Mad Magazine. Uh, if you look at some of the older uh, ep uh, issues of Mad, under the masthead you'll see uh, Charlie Cadu and Joe Rayola as the uh, senior editors, uh, along with the usual gang of idiots. Uh, I wound up knowing a couple of people who were uh, part of the Mad Crew. I got to meet with Al Feldstein, and I uh, got to meet Dave Berg, 
oh, wow. you know, the lighter side of whatever. <laughs> and uh, my ex-father-in-law was an illustrator for early Med before Alfred E. Newman. Oh, really? Yeah, his name was Jack Kamen. In fact, if you ever saw the movie Creep Show, yes, he did the comic book art for that. That's and the cool. poster with the Grim Reaper looking through the window and the little boy with the comic book uh, with a candle. That was right. Jack's artwork. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, live, living in Maine. We live in Stephen King country. I think it's almost a requirement. You either have to watch uh, one Stephen King movie or at least read one Stephen King book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I did a, a show that um, Joe and Charlie had written called Penguins and Bagpipes. Okay. And it was uh, a fun show, and I made mention of it recently to Charlie, and he said, that's a show that needs to be revived. And uh, I thought, hmm, interesting. But it had a, a good reviews, and that was my first foray onto stage acting. Hmm. So once I graduated college in 76... I wound up uh, doing some plays, and I went to acting classes. I, I studied for about six years at a place called HB Studios in uh, Greenwich Village in New York, wow. where I took scene study, technique, dance, singing, all of that stuff. And I got to study with... Uh, a, a fellow who owned the studio, his name is Herbert Berghoff. Okay. And if you've ever seen movies like Red Planet Mars, starring Peter Graves, the old B-50s uh, sci-fi movie, or um, Target, starring Gene Hackman and a young Matt Dillon, uh, Herbert Berghoff, in both cases, played the villain. And... Uh, I almost feel like I, I probably should know that name. I probably have seen it, but I'm just drawing a blank at the moment. Yeah. Well, if you get a chance, look up Herbert Berghoff, and it's B-E-R-G-O-F or B-E-R-G-H-O-F. <laughs> Berghoff. Or I can just look up Red Planet with Peter Graves, and I should find it there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Herbert's uh, wife was Uta Hagen, the... Uh, one of those, the primary acting teachers of, uh, I guess, the last 50 years. I mean, she wrote a number of acting books. She was up there with Stella Adler, Sanford Meisner, Lee Strasberg, all of those great acting teachers. <clears throat> and um, I studied on and off for, uh, I studied for six years with uh, the teachers at HB Studios and uh, got to be uh, friends with some of them. And I also studied at a place called Process Studio Theater uh, under the uh, tutelage of a guy named John Camera, who is a Shakespearean actor in New York. And I wound up, thanks to him, I wound up doing two Shakespeare plays, small parts, but um, one was uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and the other one was the Scottish play, Macbeth. Oh, I say the Scottish play. The Scottish play, yes. And is, is, isn't it true in um, for stage actors, you're not allowed to say the name because it's considered bad luck? Yes, yeah, there's this whole curse about it. And I always say, you know, that curse, as far as I'm concerned, is real. I almost had my eye taken out. Oh, wow. During that play, yeah. And, um, the, because there's a lot of combat in the play. And because there's a lot of combat in the play, actors who don't pay attention or choreographers who are less than detail-oriented as they should be, accidents happen. And of right. course, because of that, um, that's one of the reasons why they say that there's a curse. Another, you know, the old story goes that because uh, there are uh, three witches and spells are uh, mentioned and incantations are vocalized. They're saying that caused the curse. So, you know, there's a lot of stories about that, but 
I came home one night. I ha I was hosting a dance marathon at my alma mater, and uh, I had to be in New York to do Macbeth. And the accident with me happened. <clears throat> and it turns out one of the characters I played was young Seward, who uh, is in a, a duel with Macbeth toward the end of the show. And at one point, Macbeth zigged when he should have zagged, and <laughs> he almost, he wound up hitting me in the face. Oh, wow. And I, I turn, he grabs me, he slits my throat, the blood, I bite the blood capsule in my mouth, blood drips, I die beautifully. <laughs> um, I'm on the floor, the lights go out, I crawl to the side to go to the dressing room, and I get in there and I look at my face, I look like Rocky Balboa at the end of the fight. There was blood dripping down my face and... and I had to, after the show, rush to the Long Island Railroad and get to Hofstra University where I was hosting a dance marathon that was going on, of course, all night. And it looked like you and I got there. there. <laughs> and, and I get there and who, who's waiting for me but my parents. <laughs> and they see me with this gash and with the, and my mother takes one look at me, her face goes white and she says, what the hell happened? <laughs> I had to tell them. Not oh, fun. It's fine. It was a Scottish play. It's all good, mom. It's all good. Yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, I tell you, it was the magic of live theater. But I did a number of shows, a number of children's shows. And then I studied at a place called Wiest Baron, yeah. which was in New York. And uh, they do mainly uh, TV. And I studied with people there. One of them was Mary Jo Slater, the casting director for ABC. Yeah. The mother of? Christian? Yep. Christian's, Christian's mom. Christian. Yeah. And... Um, got to work with uh, people there and met some uh, people I've uh, come to know over the years. So I've studied a lot and it was from, uh, I think it was from Wies Baron or one of those places. There's another uh, uh, a seminar that I, uh, that I used to go to with a woman named Madeline Burns and she would have guest speakers and they would uh, talk about uh, being a casting director, being a director, being a producer, and or being an agent. And we would get up and we would do a monologue, we would do scene study. And I wound up getting some work from that. I wound up uh, being on a couple of soaps because of that. Right, so I mean, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you would be considered a character actor, more yeah. or less? Yeah, because I mean, I know... I actually fall into the cracks. Really? Yeah, because for some reason, maybe now I am uh, a character actor, but uh, there was a time when I was much younger where I sort of, I would come across like a character actor, but I wouldn't look character enough. Right, and I mean, I, I say character actor because I know you, you've done uh, a bunch of, uh, smaller roles on different TV shows, like you were in Superboy, you were in... Not him again. I suggest that you stop right there. Come on, there's four of us and one of him. Swamp Thing. Easy now. Let's not be impulsive. You are here to steal the water. Not steal. Discover. Investigate. Analyze, that's all. I'm a scientist. Um, you were in... Police Academy. Commissioner, Commissioner, could I get a picture of you congratulating Commandant Lassard? Of course, certainly. And uh, I'm trying to remember which Muppets movie it was. Was it the Muppets movie? No, the Muppets take Manhattan and the Muppets at Walt Disney World. Hey, they got a pet care center. Maybe they can help me. Excuse me. Hmm? Who's your owner? Owner? 
I have no owner, sir. Uh-huh. But perhaps you can help me. You see, the Walt Disney World is such a big place. I don't know what to do with all this incredible freedom. Well, now there's a solution I hadn't particularly thought of. Come now, on. Well, but come you don't on. understand. I got a license. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, uh, you're one of those guys who's like, oh, I, I know him. I may not remember his name, but I've, I've seen him in no. various things. Yeah, I, I find myself in that situation. If I looked more character at the time, I would have been more easy to cast. Uh, I wasn't character enough to be cast as a straight character actor. And I wasn't, as according to some casting directors had said over the years, I wasn't handsome enough to be a leading man. So, I understand those are really high standards in Hollywood. Yeah. And, and they for, are. for women too, you know, leading men and leading ladies have to have a certain uh, almost unattainable beauteous look. Yeah, because they're still going off of the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, when, Clark Gable like Errol and, Flynn and Clark Gable and Tyrone Power. Yeah. When those people would be the leading man Right. It would be a hard act to follow. So you, you've also gotten to know um, some very geek staple actors. Like uh, you were friends with uh, Noelle Neal, who played Lois Lane with George Reeves. And where have you been, Mr. Kent? Me? Oh, I've been around. Oh, around, eh? And I suppose you can explain why you and Superman have both been missing for approximately the same length of time. Mm -hmm. um, she also played Lois Lane with Kirk Allen. Right. That's right. She started in the serials with Kirk Allen, and then she went to the serials, and she was the uh, mom on the train in the Chris Reeves Superman movie. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, the dad was Kirk Allen. Golly! I saw a boy up there running as fast as the train! Faster even! Oh, <laughs> Lois Lane, you have a writer's gift for invention. I'll say that for you. But, uh, but... Lois, please read your book. No one ever believes me. The dad was Kirk Alley. I love how they do like those little Easter eggs. Yeah. Uh, and I know you were friends with, and I apologize, I can't remember his name, um, Jack, who played Jimmy Olsen in the- Larson, Jack Larson. Jack Larson. Um, you were friends with Frank Gorshin, who was the Riddler opposite Adam West Batman. Curses! It's got more lives than the cat! Yeah, he and I did a play together. Oh, you did? In, um, it started out in Jacksonville, Florida, at a place called the Alhambra Dinner Theater. <laughs> As Frank was, you know, uh, he was a favorite of mine. And um, as a matter of fact, I, I tape a few shows from MeTV. Oh, yeah. And one of the shows I was, I've been taping is Have Gun Will Travel. So last night, I well, saw an episode. Favorites. Frank was on the episode. <laughs> so I posted a few pictures on my Facebook page. Nice. See, it's funny. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those people, it, it drives my husband nuts, but I'm one of those, oh, you know who that is? And he's like, either pause it or wait till, till the movie or the episode's done. But I drive my girlfriend nuts too, yes. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I, I was, would be watching something and I would go, wow, does he look young. And then I stop, and Naomi says, I hate when you do that. <laughs> I was proud of myself. We were, so Mike and I have been re-watching um, both NCIS and Criminal Minds on Netflix, starting from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we were watching, uh, oh, it was a Criminal Minds episode, and the corner looked familiar. I was like, I know who that is. He goes, who is that? I said, do you remember... Uh, Alien Nation, the TV series. He goes, yeah. I said, you remember the annoying tabloid reporter, Jeff Doucette? He goes, yeah. I said, that's him. Mm -hmm. See, I was more of a fan of the movie. Oh, I love the movie. Mandy Patankin was amazing. And it's and funny. I don't know, and I know we're going a little off topic. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but there was the Alien Nation series episode where Sykes mm -hmm. re looks into his previous partner's uh, death. It was uh, Tubbs. Mm -hmm. And the mistake they made was they were showing the movie footage alongside what he was doing, which you wouldn't think would be a problem. But in the TV series on the corner slab, it was a white guy. In the movie, it was a black guy. It's like, 
you guys really didn't think that one through? Yeah, continuity. Right. So if you had to ballpark it, about how many uh, productions have you been in, uh, like TV and movies? How's that? TV and movies, uh, it hasn't been as much as one thinks. According to IMDb, it's about 15 or 16. Okay. But during the uh, time I've been in the entertainment industry, I've done a lot of commercials, a lot of live industrials, a lot of stage work. Yeah. So it, um, it's not really a good um, indication. I'm sure that's a, a question one of our viewers may, may inquire. Um, and I know you've done two fan films. You, you actually got to play the, the master in a Doctor Who fan film, which is why I picked the, the TARDIS background. So dramatic, as if they were of any importance. Oh, please, like you'd allow anyone in the whole of time and space to take priority over yourself. Only you, Doctor. Only you. You play the Joker in a Batman Beyond fan film. You know, guns don't kill people. This is so much more effective. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because you're also the, the voice of the Joker for Six Flags, correct? That's right. Regarding uh, the Joker, let's do that one first. Sure. When I lived in Florida, I had a voiceover agent named Marge Woods. And I get a call. And she says that uh, I have an audition. And it is for... Uh, Six Flags and it's to do voices for something called the Batman Stunt Show <laughs> I'm a geek so I said uh, let me think about it yes <laughs> <laughs> and I went over there and I was given uh, it, w it wasn't really a script it was lines from various characters and I had three I read for three different parts. I read for Robin, and my voice was a little too low for Robin. I was a little too old for that part. It went to uh, a friend of mine at the time, a guy named Brian Bazala, okay. who has a lovely tenor voice, a singing voice. He sounds young, <laughs> sounds very young. So he was perfect. I also was up for The Riddler, Ooh. and... That would have been close to my heart because of Frank. That's, that's but, what I was thinking. Yeah. But no, that went to someone else. I forget the guy's name. Uh, but then I was up for the Joker. Now, at the time I went to the audition, the animated series was just kicking off the ground. It was and in Mark the, really, like the first... And Mark Hamill's Joker was the penultimate voice of the character. I mean, well, the animated series itself was the penultimate representation of the whole Batman universe. Kevin Conroy, oh, yeah. and, you know, you get, uh, at that time, Efren Zimbalist Jr. was Alfred. But Mark Hamill's Joker was the penultimate. I always say Luke got a lot more fun once he went to the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's been enjoying it ever since. But I figured that the staged production of the Batman stunt show is pretty much the audience is in a half circle around the arena where the uh, action uh, happens. Yeah. And it's pretty far from the action you know you, you're sitting in the back you're seeing these little figures they're all in costume they're stunt people and they're lip-syncing to a pre-recorded track sort of like a disney okay which makes sense because this way the show runs a certain amount of time everything is paced so there are no surprises makes sense and also, it doesn't matter if people memorize the lines or not. They just have to know when they're talking so they can move and basically say the lines. 
I wanted the voice of the Joker to be familiar so that the audience knew who was talking. And yet I added me to it. Okay. So this way I took Mark Hamill's Joker voice and I added me and it worked. So I wound up getting a call from Marge saying you booked the Joker. And it's funny because when they gave me what I laughingly call the script, which it really <laughs> wasn't, <coughs> because <clears throat> there were about a half a dozen shows at that time out of all of the Six Flags across America. The different Batman stunt shows had different scripts. Okay. There were times where the Joker was not in the script. If the Joker was not in the script, I played four of the Riddler's henchmen. Oh. So there I was talking to myself at some <laughs> points, you know, in different voices. But what I would do is they gave me uh, about 10 or 12, actually more like 15 pages. And they're, they're like different paragraphs, one after the other, just of my lines. Okay. And the director who was on the other side with the, with the TD uh, engineer uh, would tell me what was happening in, in the scene and what my emotional content would be. It's another way of saying, all right, I'm saying this line, what's my motivation? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, what am I, I would doing here? Am I getting kicked in the teeth? Am I threatening somebody? What? Yeah. And of course, you know, at, at the end of all of the readings, I would have to do a lot of the grunts and groans because when the Joker gets punched by Batman, he has to have you know, those sort of things. Yeah. The reactions. So that's what I did. And when I was finished, a guy named Bob, I think, I think he was the, was he the president of Six Flags or was he with Warner? Don't remember. But he asked me if I would do his uh, cell phone message as the Joker. There I am at the end of my gig saying, I'm terribly sorry, but Bob is not available. He's <laughs> all tied up. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it was a lot of fun. So ever since then, when they would have a new show or when the show would be changed in any way, I would be called in. I would get paid very nicely <laughs> and I would do the corrections or do the new shows. And uh, then the wind up was uh, the New Jersey show where I'm still living in Orlando and I get taken to, and this you'll enjoy this, uh, I get taken to a place called Stark Studios <laughs> in Orlando. And I'm thinking to myself, Stark Studios, this guy is everywhere. <laughs> I mean, he owns everything yeah. anyway. Yeah. So I go in there and I'm taken to, you know, usually when you do voiceovers, you're in a little phone booth yeah. with, that's made out of glass. And you have the music stand with the script, with the microphone, with the headphones. And they're talking to you. They're punching the keys. They're talking to you from the TD board, the technical director's board. They bring me to this room, this big room that's like a little auditorium. And in the middle of it is the music stand with the script, with the headphones and the microphone. And they're on the voice other, actor needs. Yeah, but <laughs> they're on the other side of the glass and talking to me through the TD board. I'm looking around at this huge room and I'm not used to it. I'm used to the little phone booth. The, uh, the director, he punches in and he says, okay, Jeff, <clears throat> this show is going to be a little different. We do not want Cesar Romero, Jack Nicholson, Mark Hamill, any of those. We want the Joker's voice to be more like yours or choose a different voice. 
And I said to him, you know, it's funny you should say that because I come into this room and the first thing I thought of was, nice place you got here, lots of space. <laughs> and they're looking at me like, don't do that. No, 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 no. He wouldn't like it. So I gave this goofy ass voice and, and I wasn't thrilled with it, but that's what they wanted. So it's their sandbox. And again, they paid me well, but this was uh, Batman versus Catwoman was the name of the show. Uh, so uh, what is, uh, I mean, acting wise, the differences between a voice actor and a, and a physical actor? I mean, I mean, it's, it's uh, almost two different techniques, correct? It is and it isn't. Uh, the main thing that you have to realize is that with voice acting, your character, the only place that your character can be physical is behind a microphone. The audience isn't going to see you, but it is through the physical action that the energy comes through your voice. Say in an animated film, though, the more animated you are, usually the animators are going to be there next to you or in front of you looking at your movements so they can have a reference as far as how the character is going to move because it's going to be based on you. The physicality is to make your performance more believable. With a regular actor on stage or on screen, you have the luxury of visuals. So anything that you do in your performance is going to be seen by the audience. Basically, acting is acting is acting is acting. And there are just a number of adjustments to be made because everything has to be real. Right. Otherwise, the audience won't believe it, which means that uh, if you are going to be on a stage, then you're going to want to be able to play to the back of the theater. If you are on television and the camera is right there in front of you, the less you do, the better, because... You won't be able to do all of this while the camera is right here. Right. Also, like background with, I got behind me. <laughs> yeah. Also with movies. Basically, when you're acting on camera, I, I used to always say that, um, and I've learned this, that uh, the more actors with close-ups, the better. So if you want a close-up, you do less. If you are in a situation where you have to be frantic or be upset or trash a room or something like that, then you could be as active as you want. You just won't have a close-up because it's going to be a wide angle of you destroying a room or whatever. Right. It's not so much about what it's not so much about you as what you're doing at that point. Exactly. I want to ask you real quick about uh, another character that you did for Disney, which is making a comeback in steampunk circles. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. It, it's funny because I've been seeing the, the comics and he really is having uh, quite the resurgence, again, especially in steampunk circles. So uh, He's it, it's a Marvel character. Yep. He's in Marvel comic books. I was so proud of that. <laughs> it was so great. I, I was doing a convention. And I think it was the Florida Supercon. And all of a sudden, this guy walks up to me. <clears throat> and he says, oh, you're, you were one of the dream finders. And I said, yeah. He said, did, did you see the um, Figment comic books? My eyes went wide and I said, excuse me? <laughs> Figment comic books? 
He goes, yeah, there's a graphic novel of it. And there's like six issues, five, six issues. I said, I knew nothing about this. And he brought over some of the comic books. And I said, seriously? <laughs> yeah. And uh, a guy came over afterwards. I gave the guy a, an autograph of me as the dream finder with figment. And another guy walks over and he says, uh, you gave um, one of my coworkers a picture of you as the dream finder. I said, yeah. And he says, I th we thought you might like this. And it was the graphic novel. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. So, yeah, uh, I became aware of the series. Uh, they did a one-shot kind of free sample for free comic book day one year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know you weren't the, the first Dream Finder, but how... I was the last one. You were the last one. Okay, I was going to say, where in that line? Because it's, it's almost like a Doctor Who actors. I mean, no, you weren't the first. There were others in between. But where did, where did you fall in that? <laughs> Turns out that, um, yeah, I, when I first came in, there was already rumblings of changes. Yeah. Um, why exactly, I don't know, but it uh, seems that um, Figment, and therefore the Dream Finder, their main sponsor was Kodak. Oh, they were not a complete Disney character. It was, you know, the whole journey into imagination, the whole Kodak cameras going on, uh, taking it anywhere you want and fuel your imagination. You know, the whole thing was about imagination. And as a matter of fact, the Kodak pavilion at Epcot was about the journey into imagination. And the character fueling that and and uh, promoting that was Figment, a little purple dragon with orange horns and yellow wings. And, and I was one of the meet and greet characters with a puppet Figment meeting and greeting the people as they were going into Journey into Imagination. Yes. Now, the very first... Dream Finder. I never knew who that was. I couldn't place the voice because when I would go from the uh, dressing rooms through a hallway to get uh, behind the pavilion where I would come out as the Dream Finder, there would be uh, tapes playing and you would hear the Dream Finder's voice and Figment's voice. Okay. Now, Figment... Figment was originally voiced by Billy Barty. Billy Barty, why does that sound familiar? He was a little person. He was in Willow. He was. That's why. Yes. Okay. It's like I know the name, and I was drawing. Ugh. And if you're into me TV, if you ever watched Peter Gunn, he was a character called Babby, and he I... was a, a crook, but he was a friend of Peter Gunn's, and he would. Uh, play pool and be a pool hustler, but he was a little person. He was also in Time Bandits, if I recall, or am I confusing mm. him with someone else? He was. Okay. So Billy Barty was the original voice of Figment, but I could never place who was the voice of the Dream Finder. Then came one year at San Diego Comic Con. I was at the table, all my stuff was laid out. Who comes around the corner but one of my old boyhood heroes, an actor and voice actor by the name of Chuck McCann. It's a voice I know too, and it's weird. Most of the time my brain's going like 90 miles an hour and I can connect all this stuff. And tonight it's like, nope, just let him talk. <laughs> yeah. Chuck McCann was uh, a New York comic actor, and he had a children's show called Let's Have Fun. That's he really was one of the founding members of Sons of the Desert, the Laurel and Hardy Appreciation Society, That's where cool. each one of the chapters were, were called Tents. Also, he did a movie with Alan Arkin called The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. 
I if you look him up, you're going to say, Laurel oh, I remember him. I probably know more from the Laurel and Hardy connection, but I feel like there's something else. I'll have to... Very well be. I mean, he played Laurel and Hardy along with Dick Van Dyke playing Stan. Yeah. And Chuck I might be thinking of Ollie. Ollie. I'll have to double check him on IMDb. With also, uh, in, I think, the... But I think it was either the 70s or 80s where he was the voice of Ben Grimm. That could be it, too. That could be where I'm Did you get making that? reference to. Yeah. Um, so, but he comes up to my table, and I look at him, and I'm going like this. <laughs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> and, and he looks at my table, and he sees the picture of me as the dream finder. He says, you know... I was the body reference and the original voice of the dream finder. And goes, that was you. <laughs> and he says, yeah. And then he does the dream finder voice. So I went, yeah, it is you, but I have a picture of us together. And it's, uh, the first dream finder and the last dream finder. It was, uh, a good run of me as the dream finder. I was, uh, I was mentored in that role by a fellow named Steve Taylor who played the dream finder for 15 years. Oh, wow. It was nice. Uh, so I do want to act, ask you about uh, one of the more prominent geek actors uh, because you worked with them, the of Dick Durock. <laughs> now you were on an episode of the Swamp Thing series. Right. What was it like working with, with Durock? Uh, interestingly enough, I got to meet with and chat with him, but uh, and we were in the scene together, but we did not shoot together. See, Dick was at that. This was the uh, pretty much the last season that he did as Swamp Thing. The makeup was starting to play havoc on his skin. Oh, you know the green makeup. And uh, as I was talking to him at one point, I, uh, I said, you know, this is going to be a, a first for me. I'm looking forward to being put into all of that old man makeup because I play a 200-year-old man looking for the fountain of youth. <laughs> and he, looked, he looked at me and he rolled his eyes and he says, yeah, that'll get old very quickly. Now, we had a um, spectacular a uh, sci-fi makeup director by the name of Jim Benke. Mm -hmm. And he was able to uh, get Dick's time in the makeup chair and the costuming chair down to about 45 minutes. Oh, wow. That's impressive considering everything he was, he was wearing. Because a lot of it was a bodysuit. Yeah. Big it rubber bodysuit. <laughs> And um, it was so funny because uh, we were to do a scene where I am with my wife, Celia, in the scene. And Scott, who was Swamp Thing's companion or friend. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the teenage boy at that time. Yeah, the young, young dark-haired, handsome kid. He... Uh, was asking me about all of this with the, uh, uh, he doesn't understand why I'm looking for whatever I'm looking for. And, uh, and I do that whole monologue with, do you believe in wizards or magic? And going through that, but I never did until an old man stood over a furnace with a beaker. You believe in wizards or magic? I never did, until one day, an old man stood over a furnace with a beaker. It bubbled and settled into the clearest blue liquid you could have ever found. He held it out and said, Drink, my friend. Drink and live. 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 One drop of life called aqua vitae. Inexplicable. Wondrously, a drop each day until the potion is used, along with all hopes for future life. 
So that's why you're looking for the fountain of youth. So you can refill those things. Oh, I see it all clearly now. You told him too much. Now he's planning to kill me so he can have the water for himself. Rob and it bubbled and settled into the clearest blue liquid you could have ever found. And doing that whole thing, yeah. and I'm starting to lose my mental facilities because of my obsession with finding more of the fountain of youth and keeping on to my youth. And it's becoming an obsession with me. And my, uh, I guess my feelings of right and wrong and being able to differentiate is starting to go. And my desperation is looking to put blame anywhere. So I'm thinking that uh, Celia and Scott are in this against me. So at which point I pull out a gun and I yell, I've come too far to lose now. And all of a sudden you see it cut to Swamp Thing open up the door, pushing Scott out of the way and I'm shooting the gun at Swamp Thing. <laughs> right. We did not shoot that scene together. No. No. I shot my end of the scene where the cameras were on me earlier in the day. And then and they hand over to him later. Yes. Okay. Makes and sense. what's interesting is, and I, I must say, Dick was uh, an underrated actor. He was good. I'm I'm a huge Swamp Thing fan. I've got like all the but, movies. I've got almost yeah. all the series. I think, but yeah. But he also was a very conscientious stunt man. Yeah, because he used to His, stunt for uh, the gentleman who played Perigno. Major Don West in the original Lost in Space series. Yeah. Um, didn't he also for what was it? It was Mark Goddard. Yeah. Um, was it Fall Guy? He was also a stunt man on. Yeah, and he was also he also did some stunts and he star he coast he guest starred in an episode of The Incredible Hulk. That's right, Fry's Creature, mm -hmm. which is which always cracks me up because uh, I saw that when I was younger. I was probably uh, mid to late teens when I saw that, mm -hmm. and I saw the name Dick Durock, and I knew enough to know the name, and it kind of cracks me up. It's like the poor man has made his living in green body makeup. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But he was—he was—he uh, was also actually that tall, correct? I mean, I mean he was. Oh like yeah, big guy. Se seven foot something. No, 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 not quite that much. I would say he was probably about six eight. Six eight. Okay, close to seven. Yeah, he was probably about the same size as David Prowse, Darth okay. Vader, the right. Darth Vader body. No, David was also six eight. Yeah. Um, now, from what I understand, the reason that Dick became so cemented with Swamp Thing was because when they did the first movie with Wes, with Wes Craven and uh, Ray Wise was the human version, um, they initially just wanted him to do stunts because he was mostly known as a stuntman, right. uh, but realized the makeup looked different on different actors, and you could clearly tell that uh, it wasn't it, the difference between Ray Wise and Dick Durock, so they were just like, just, just play it. Yeah. And that's pretty much how we got to own the road. Is, is that right? Pretty much, yeah. That's, that's, the way, that's the way I heard it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that was a special uh, feature on the, the first Swamp Thing movie. Yeah, and um, also you, you do know that um, at least in the TV show, or I think probably in maybe the movies too, the voice was uh, dubbed. I did not know that. Yeah, it was, uh, from what I had heard, it was a New York voice actor who voiced, who dubbed Dick's voice. That's, see, a matter I of, knew, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a matter of getting the timber right, or, or no. I don't know why, but that's what happened. It's funny, because he was uh, pretty garbled in the first movie, spoke amazingly clearly in the second movie, and then the TV series... It's like he had a frog in his throat. <laughs> yeah, well, that was uh, electronic uh, manipulation. Yeah. Uh, favorite or most fun project and your worst project? 
so many favorite projects. <laughs> Work, working with the Muppets had to have been a favorite. Oh, how, how can you not love working with the Muppets? It was, it was, it was an experience that, unless if you've worked with Jim Henson and Frank Oz and the Muppets, yeah. you wouldn't have any other frame of reference simply because of the way things were on set. Uh, for instance, whenever kids would come onto the set, production would stop and they would do a puppet show for the kids. That is awesome. <laughs> it, it would, that, that's the way it was. And, and Jim, who uh, never would have to worry about money, would his pretty uh his attitude was pretty much yeah the money is okay but let's be creative let's have fun and he would he would be a kid who had carte blanche to do anything he wanted and he was the type of kid who did these incredible things <clears throat> he wasn't like the kid who was the bull in the china shop he was the kid who was a genius at creating these amazing things. And we, as an audience, got to benefit from it. Didn't have to worry about going out and finding puppeteers. The puppeteers gravitated to him. One of the funniest things was when, uh, if you've ever been on a, a set you know that about 60% of the time is waiting. Yeah. Waiting for the actors, waiting uh, for the sets to be created or waiting for the track that the camera's gonna dolly on, waiting for uh, the grips to uh, handle that, waiting for lighting, waiting for whatever. A lot, but of, a lot of it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a lot of it is hurry up and wait. Now, <clears throat> when we're puppeteers, to give you an idea of the mechanics of it, yeah, imagine an office chair. Okay. And it's on the rolling casters, and you're sitting on the seat and you know there's a, a pole in between giving the chair its height yeah take away the pole that's what they were now, so long <laughs> now the seat is pretty much on the casters we're sitting on that so this way when we hold the hand up with the puppet it it's about high like level okay oh. and <laughs> on our between on our legs is a little monitor where we could see what the camera sees. I think puppeteering is probably the only art form, especially on television, where you could actually see your performance as it's being performed. Essentially, I, I knew they did something to differentiate or to make the height more even. I had no idea about the monitor at the lab. Mm -hmm. And it also is configured with a big monitor in the middle of the camera area. <coughs> this way it, it helps with referencing as far as framing is concerned and things like that. Well, there was one instance where we're waiting and the two people or the um, people the two characters on camera were Kermit and Piggy. Now, that would be Jim and Frank. And it's, it has to be an optical illusion, but it has been something that has amazed me ever since I saw it. Oh, now you've definitely got my curiosity. Now, Kermit is a very soft, his, his head is very soft, so, Jim can manipulate it. Like it basically was a sock puppet. Piggy, on the other hand, is a molded head. Yeah, she's got the snout. Yeah, but it's not soft like Kermit's. It's a molded head, 
that Frank is able to manipulate. So Kermit has much more expression than Piggy does. Yeah. Kermit can look like, and all of these different mouth movements that Piggy can't do. And it, this has to be an illusion, but it fascinated me. When Frank and Jim had their arms up and Kermit and Piggy are framed in the monitor, after a while, Frank's arm started to get tired. Yeah, he's, and he's holding his, Yeah, and he's holding his arm up there. And when Frank's arm got tired, I'm looking at Piggy's face and she looked like this. <laughs> like she was staring. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, this has to be an optical illusion. <laughs> so Because we, we associate their personalities to them, whether someone's controlling their movement. Or not. Yeah. But now here's what's funny. Jim picked up on this. Mm -hmm. So we're all looking at the monitor and Kermit starts moving toward Piggy, who is just staring off into space. Mm -hmm. And Kermit starts going, you are getting sleepy. <laughs> you are getting sleepy. <laughs> like he's hypnotizing her. And out of Piggy's mouth, you're hearing, ah. <laughs> And Kermit starts going into this whole big hypnotizing thing where he's telling Piggy that she's go he's bringing her through past lives. Oh my God. And she keeps going <laughs> until finally Kermit looks at Piggy and, and in the meantime, I'm just going, please, someone hit a record button. <laughs> and finally Kermit says, you are in a past life. Who are you? And all of a sudden, out of Piggy's mouth comes, Bert. <laughs> That's awesome. Who's also one of Frank's characters. At least but, it wasn't Yoda. That would have probably been a little too weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. From what right. I'd heard on the set of The Empire Strikes Back, when um, Frank would get tired after a long day of shooting and he's manipulating and voicing Yoda. I had heard that you could always tell when Frank got tired because Yoda started to sound like Grover. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, so that's, that's your favorite, most fun project you've done. What's, what's the worst? Uh, you don't have to name names if you don't want to. <laughs> I'm trying to go through and I'm thinking to myself, what did I not like? That's a hard one. The only, the only thing that I could think of was dodging the accidents in Macbeth. You actually got wounded. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I, I loved pretty much everything I did. I mean, I think one of the worst voiceover things was that, was that Batman versus Catwoman only because I couldn't use my usual Joker voice. They wanted something new. Yeah. Okay. And um, I also did um, another puppeteering gig that was good. It was fun. I enjoyed myself. But uh, nothing ever really came of it. And yet there have been over the years teachers who remember it. I did a series of math place programs for Scholastic. Oh, you did? Yeah. And it was for grades one and two. And the premise was a clubhouse. Three boys, three girls. Yeah. And a spider mascot. Because that's not going to freak kids out. No. <laughs> In fact, the spider had rollerblades on. In fact, if you look at my Facebook page, you'll see a picture. Right on there, me po poking my head out from 
behind boxes with the spider puppet next to me. <laughs> but I voiced and manipulated it. And it was fun. But uh, I got paid well, too. But nothing came of it. I only had raw footage of it. The quality was poor. Wow. But it was basically um, the spider helping kids to learn about math and community service and how to tell time and how to measure things and basically be part of the community and, and to uh, do things on their own, that sort of thing. It's right, because I think of it, and I think of like all these, you know, memes online about burning the house down to get the spider, and just the thought of six kids in the school room, like, here's your teacher, a giant spider. Oh my god! That's Funny thing is, if you look at the spider puppet, when I first saw him, I thought to myself, he looks like a cousin of one of the Ninja Turtles. Okay, now let's look at picture. <laughs> yeah, no, it's right there. Uh, it uh, it was something that I posted ten years ago, so it was a Facebook memory, just a uh, just a two or three days ago. So it's right there on my Facebook page. Wow! And it's uh, is it on your professional your your acting page too? Yeah. Cool. There were so many things that I I enjoyed doing. I think the things that I did not enjoy the most were some of the auditions. I mean, some of them, they were, they were such, I'm sorry, the word is asinine. Uh, it was such a, the stupid, stupid things. I so lived so in- somebody who doesn't know, what's, what's an actor's audition process like? Okay. There are so many different versions of an, an, an audition process depending upon who's doing the audition. Now, for instance, usually you get your sides from an agent and like maybe the day before, you go over it, you learn it as much as you possibly can. You go in, you sign in, the uh, person in charge of talent wrangling wrangles you into the audition area where there's a camera mm -hmm. and it's either the casting director and the person who is doing the filming. One of them is the person you'll be reading with okay. or sometimes maybe the director will be there. Maybe the producers will be there. It depends. It depends on uh, how quickly they need the casting, how, uh, how much the director and the producer hate going to auditions. It depends. Sometimes they'll only see you at the callback. But I, I, you know, certain, certain things were just done and it's almost like there had to be a sadistic tone to it where <clears throat> I lived in Orlando. I had to drive four hours to Miami. Yeah. And go in, this was for a um, series of ads, most of them print ads. They wouldn't take sending in a, a photo or anything like that. I had to be there. They asked me to <clears throat> hold a cigarette like a European. In other words, Like oh, this. Look all, look all sophisticated. Continental way of, you know, like a German way of uh, holding a cigarette. They took two pictures and they said, thank you. And then I had to drive four hours back. That does seem kind of time wasty. It's like I, I could just as easily have taken a picture of me like this and sent it to them. Mm -hmm. And then there's one that my girlfriend cracks up every time I mention it. <laughs> okay. When I was living in New York, I went to an audition and the casting director wanted me to play a cigarette. <laughs> and I said, uh, you want me to what? I want you to be a cigarette. 
And in my mind, I'm thinking, do you want me to play menthol or <laughs> filter <Slim> regular <laughs> shift or what? <laughs> yeah. Am I coming out of a crush poof box? I don't know. <laughs> so needless to say, I did not get the job. But I'm, I'm, I, I sort of wonder what they were looking for. So, you know, some of the auditions are just, really? Seriously? There was one where uh, they wanted several people auditioning at the same time. They wanted to be animals. Now, there was one audition I went to, which you really should hear about. Okay. I used to work in, in New York, in Manhattan. I used to work for a company that uh, <clears throat> did promotional work. They would hire actors to do promotions for various companies. Like if ever you've gone to Bloomingdale's or Macy's or any of those big stores and you'd see people uh, grilling hot dogs or whatever and yeah. having to try them. That's one of the that's one of the, the jobs. But there was this one job I was called in from this agency and I was in this meeting and I'm sitting around with several other people and the ad agency person comes in, he says, Thank you for being here and we're gonna ask you to promote uh, a toy that is in development. Okay. Said, That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they said, okay, now let's show you the toy. And he brings out this little truck. Okay. Nice. I used to have something like that when I was a kid. And he says, yes, but look. And he manipulates it and it turns into a robot. Transformers. <laughs> that was the meeting. So did I you was at, do an ad for, for Transformers? I wound up being part of their promotional team. Oh, wow. I had to walk around licensing parties, events, um, toy departments in Bloomingdale's and Macy's and all of these licensing parties dressed in huge molded plastic suits. I was, I was Grimlock. Grimlock. That is amazing. Seriously. Both, both his Autobot and his Dinobot. And you could see that on my page also. And I was also Starscream. That is, that is amazing. And those suits were nightmares. I can imagine. I've had to wear the big, like, mascot suits for, for things in the past. And uh, the inflatable minion suit. Mm -hmm. is, yeah. <laughs> but imagine when you, when, when I'm in my Starscream suit, and there, there's pictures that were put into a collage by a friend of mine, taken from the original Polaroids. Starscream has like a six foot wingspan, you know, from the airplane wings. That must have been fun going through doors. It was worse going through toy aisles. Oh, and also, you know, like the shelves. Yeah. And when you're encased in these suits, you don't have a sense of distance. So, you know, if somebody calls you and you turn around, it's like a Three Stooges routine. <laughs> the, the wings go whap. You know, and they, they hit people. But one of the worst was the Grimlock Dinobot. The tail. Because it was a big, yeah. Well, one of the reasons is it's all molded plastic. It didn't move. Now, my legs were in the dinosaur's legs, the T-Rex's legs. And the whole top half came Back, from back to front over and I was encased like a tank in this T-Rex body and I could see through a screen you'll see it in the picture when I would be walking through the toy aisles 
looking through the screen at what's in front of me, one of the biggest nightmares would be when kids would come up behind me because they would lift the tail. And knock you over. The tail did not move. So the only thing that I am seeing through this screen is forward and down. Now when that happens, basic instinct, I'm trying to right myself. But you're a T-Rex and don't have long arms. <laughs> well, it's not only that, but when I do find something, I'm pulling down shelves with me. Yeah, I gotta say, like I said, I used to wear the mascot type suits because um, I used to work at the, the Barnes and Noble in Augusta, Maine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just share with you a quick, I, the worst experience I had was because uh, they get these costumes in on a monthly rotation. And I was the only one willing to wear them because I cosplay and I know the drill. I can handle it. It's not a big deal. One time we got Clifford the Big Red Dog in. Not a big deal, but the helmet, it's, the nose is like mostly foam. So it's, it's heavy just because of that. And because mm -hmm. of the nose, I can't see down very well. Right. So I'm in the children's department. I'm interacting with kids. And my, my handler, who was uh, one of the children's department workers, like, I forgot the camera so we can put this on, on the website. So she runs. And I'm like, I'll be fine for five minutes. This little girl gets my attention. So I kneel down, and she starts punching me in the nose. I can't feel it, but still, I'm like, why would you, and you're, you're in the suit, so you know, well, you, you're not supposed to say anything. It's like, you're in the suit, you're in the character, you don't let on, it's a suit. So I'm doing my best, I'm trying to turn my head, paw over my nose, paw over my eye, like, ow, that hurts. She pulls my hand off the nose, continues punching me, and her mother is sitting right there going, oh, isn't that cute? Thankfully, my hand handler came back. I was like, no, 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 it's not nice to punch the doggy. <laughs> that's the worst thing I've had in, in a suit like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, we actually know someone who's done a fair amount of work with Transformers animated series. Uh, actually, lives right here in Cape Elizabeth, Jeff Klein. Okay. He'd done a Transformers Prime, um, Transformers Rescue Bots. There's a couple other series I can't remember, but he was, he was the writer for that. A buddy of mine is Greg Berger, the voice of Grimlock in the animated series. Oh, that's too funny. <laughs> um, I would say to him, from one Grimlock to another. Uh, so, so do you have any recent or uh, upcoming projects you want to tell us about? I've been writing. You've been writing. What have you been, what have you been writing, Jeff? I wrote a stage play that uh, had a table read, and hopefully it'll go much further once this craziness is over with the pandemic. And you've written a children's book too, right? Wrote a children's book. Yeah. Wrote the sequel, haven't gotten it illustrated though. Uh, and I'm thinking about maybe, uh, see, when it comes to children's books, there's a lot they don't tell you you know, you're going through a minefield not knowing that it's a minefield. <laughs> so there are things that uh, you really have to do research. Like I didn't know that the best way to get it published would be to send it unillustrated unless if you were the illustrator. Because the publisher has a stable of artists that they work with. So, Makes sense. Yeah, so I pretty much did that one backwards. And, uh, no, but I've been writing, uh, I wrote a play, wrote uh, a couple of screenplays. And uh, so I know I kind of have a problem with it whenever I get in a costume and I'm about to leave the house. And I'm sure uh, kids who do drama or cosplay probably have the mm -hmm. same feeling. But um, I've heard that even seasoned actors such as you, yourself uh, occasionally get that initial um, stage or performance anxiety before you... Oh, sure. Well, you have to a little bit. Going on to a stage, uh, and this is this has almost been like a... Um, through scientific research, they came up with this. I don't know who would be interested in, in finding this out, but 
public speaking in general, getting out on stage in front of people brings a person, the average person's anxiety level up, a fighter pilot. I, I didn't realize it got that high, but that, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. Now, there are people who are more comfortable on stage than they are in real life. I guess that's okay. Um, but there is a certain amount of anxiety only because you're about to step into the unknown. Even if you know the part backwards and forwards, you've done it for years. The thing is, each audience is like its own animal. Okay. Because every audience is different. Every audience is comprised of different people. What works one night may not work the next night. Uh, what gets a joke one night may fall flat the next night, and all of a sudden you'll say, oh, really? And it'll get a huge laugh for no reason. Uh, sometimes uh, props may not work. Sometimes uh, the wrong pop props may work, but in the wrong sequence. <laughs> like there's an old story about... Uh, Two guys in a drawing room comedy, and they're talking, and all of a sudden, the person in the booth accidentally hits the telephone buzzer, and the phone <laughs> rings, and it's not supposed to, and the two actors are just looking at each other. Did you hear that phone Thinking ring? themselves, this isn't <laughs> supposed to happen. But finally, one of the actors reaches in and picks up the phone, and he's thinking and thinking, and he goes, Hello? And of course, there's nothing there. Yeah. And finally, he doesn't know what else to say. And he goes, it's for you. And he hands <laughs> it to the other actor. <clears throat> so, you know, things like that happen. Right. Like, so for, for my experience, I know anytime I leave the house in a cosplay, whether it's to go to a parade or go to a convention. Sure. No matter how many times I've done it, I get that I'm really going out in public like this. And I know people who, like, attend their first conventions, I'm sure, have that same anxiety. Or, uh, again, kids who are in uh, drama class or, you know, they, they might worry that uh, having that anxiety isn't normal. So, so to hear from a veteran actor like yourself is, is actually really reassuring that yeah. this is, this oh, is yeah. normal. <laughs> you know, and there are times where it would be uh, costume dilemmas. I did a production of Carousel years and years and years and years ago. Did you know that's set in Maine? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was uh, the sailor in the hornpipe, one of, one of the roles I played. And while we're doing the song, this is a real nice clam bake, I sit down with my partner and all of a sudden I hear pop. Was and it? all of a sudden, I get very drafty. <laughs> Turns out, on stage, my pants split. Oh, my. <laughs> so, I'm sitting there, and we're singing the rest of the song, and at the end of the song, I get up with my front to the audience and make my way right next to me is the wing so i and i ran downstairs to the wardrobe no one was there i grab a needle and thread and i based my pants which were practically in just two legs oh. that's how much they split and i was able to finish it just as i was about to go back on wow there was another instance it wasn't me it was a friend of mine uh i don't know if you're familiar with the actress kim hunter again it sounds familiar i just i'm having a she hard played, time she played the original stella in okay Street yep she was also dr zira in planet of the apes okay yes that's probably where i know it from right she was a friend of mine and um i got to see her in a number of shows one of the shows I saw her in was, 
and it was in Florida. It was Belle of Amherst. Mm -hmm. It was a one woman show about Emily Dickinson. And it was just her. And she comes out. This is maybe five minutes into the play. And all of a sudden she, she goes and she looks at the audience. She says, excuse me. And she turns and she leaves. And the audience is waiting and waiting. And about a minute or so later, and if you think about it, a minute is a long time with nothing going is on. Eternity. <laughs> she comes back on and does the rest of the play. I went backstage, my mother and I, we went backstage to see her, see her and her husband. And she's told me right in the middle of her speech, her dress ripped. Oh. It's like it just fell apart. Oh. So she had to make her way back and get the wardrobe person to baste her up. Oh. And it, again, the magic of live theater. Uh, I've only got uh, two more questions for you. That and as zoom much on. as you want. <laughs> I great, greatly appreciate it. Um, so before COVID, how many uh, conventions would you attend or participate in on average? On average, for a, for quite a while, it averaged out to be one a month. It would almost be twelve conventions a year, which would average about one a month, even though. I would have two and three in one month and none in another month. But I used to go back and forth. I used to, I would used to go all over the country. No, San uh, Diego, uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for XCON. Metropolis, uh, Illinois. <laughs> sure, absolutely Metropolis. That's like my second home. I always said if uh, Mike and I could live anywhere else other than Maine, it would be Metropolis. Mm -hmm. um, so do you go... When you go, uh, do you get a table yourself or are you invited as a guest? A little bit of both. Okay. Depends. Depends on the, uh, the coordinators. And because uh, I'm sure they're, if, if they've stuck with us this long, <laughs> any uh, advice for any aspiring voice actors or actors, anybody who wants to get into theater? Um. Number one, learn your craft. Number two, do it. Do it, 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 do it. Keep doing it. Study. Study life. Study, you know, Stella Adler came up with a very profound lesson, and that is growth as an actor and growth as a human being should be simultaneous. That makes the more sense. You, the more you act, the more you learn, just like the more you live, the more you learn. And your perspective on life and perspective on your art will change, will mature. All of a sudden, the uh, things that you've done early on are going to take on different meanings. All of a sudden, you're going to say to yourself, that could be better. And I know how to make it better now. See, that, that brings uh, up kind of a follow-up question, which is, um, I know, well, that, I don't know, but I've heard that there are some actors who don't like to watch their own performances because they get overly critical of themselves. Yeah, uh, very self-conscious. I'm like one of them. I won't watch. I was going to ask. <laughs> See, Actors, by nature, see when it, a person who is an actor uh, sits on a razor's edge in that on one side, you have to be vulnerable emotionally so that you have access to that when you're performing. This way the audience will believe you and be carried along in your character's journey from beginning to middle to end. 
So you have to be vulnerable so you have access to that emotions, that series of emotions. On the other hand, you have to build a tough skin so that you don't take rejection personally. That, that balance. Both sides of that, yeah. Now, actors, as most artists, are very self-conscious. With actors, we're self-conscious about how we look, how we move, uh, how we walk, uh, anything. So if actors were forced to watch the dailies of their job, of the days of the day's shoot, all they would see is the flaws. Why am I standing like that? Oh, why do I look at that hair? Look at, oh my God, are you kidding me? Do I really look like that? Do I sound like that? We, could, we would wind up in a puddle. We would not be able to function. Wow. So we just have to do our work. That's it. I mean, I watch the finished product because I'm done with it. But... No chance to fix it. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So thank you so much for, for talking to us, Jeff. Uh, we're Always going to, a pleasure, Amanda. Oh, like I said, I, I miss seeing you at Superman, you know, even though we can't get there as often as we'd like. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have links to all of Jeff's work if you want to check it out. Uh, he responds very well to messages. So if you have any questions that I didn't think to ask, feel free to ask him. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, um, you probably got a little more time on your hands than you'd like. <laughs> oh, I, like I said, I stay busy and I'm writing. So right. I'm in my own little world. <laughs> so, but I, I can say from personal experience, he's a nice enough guy. If you ask him uh, a question, he will answer it. So thanks for tuning into this episode of CGU Learning Center, and we'll see you next week.